I'd like to start by thanking the members of the Academy. Uh, I'm an academic. I consider this one of the most privileged and rewarding lives that there is for anyone, and it is not possible without people like you. So I, speaking on behalf of all my colleagues, am deeply, deeply grateful, and I mean that. The Economist newspaper, that's what the English call a magazine, they call it a newspaper. As the Economist newspaper warned in 2002, genetics may yet threaten privacy, kill autonomy, make society homogeneous, and gut the concept of human nature. But neuroscience could do all those things first. Well, what I'm here to tell you is not yet, probably never, stop worrying, relax. Now, the one thing I'm going to say is, I have no slideshow. I'm just going to talk to you. <laughs> all right, before I get going, I need to have a couple of disclaimers. This is all going to be very brief and uh, breathtakingly superficial, so I need some disclaimers. First, I am not a dualist. I do not believe we have immaterial souls or minds that are somehow independent of our brains. Uh, secondly, this is not meant to be, although it will be somewhat deflationary, it is not meant to be a critique of neuroscience. Neuroscience is real, astonishing, fascinating, great science. My critique is largely having to do with its relation to the law. And let me be clear when I say that the, um, I'm not a dualist, but I do, I do think our uh, mind supervenes upon our brain. If your brain is dead, you're dead. So in fact, the brain is always going to be part of the explanation. The goal for neurolaw is not to dismantle law. It's not to tell us how to live. No science can do that. The task for neuroscience and law is to help us sensibly to improve law when it can. Now, to help make all this clear to everybody, I want to start with a demonstration. I'm going to give you a signal. It's going to say, please do it now. And when I give you that signal, what I want you to do is for me, please to raise your non-dominant arm. Please do it now. Thank you very much. Now, notice, by the way, I got 100% compliance. And I've done this, I cannot tell you how many times in how many different audiences, although not with temporary office workers. And I always get 100% compliance. I would also like to point out to you that this was not an acausal random event in the universe. Think what you would have to believe to believe that all of a sudden, when I finished uttering the words, please do it now, everyone in this room raised their non-dominant arm at that moment. It wouldn't have happened but for my words. I can assure you it wouldn't have happened but for my words. So that was not in your control, quote unquote. Now suppose I were to call on one of you, pretend this was a law classroom, and I had the opportunity to humiliate you, and I called on one of you and I said, why did you do that? Not one of the people in this room, including the neuroscientists, would tell me a story about their brain and their nervous system. <laughs> they would tell me a story something like this. I desired to get something out of this lecture. I believe if I cooperate with the lecture that, in fact, the lecture will go better, I'll get more out of it. So therefore, I formed the intention to raise my non-dominant arm at the signal, and I did. That's just the kind of story you will always tell to explain your behavior to yourself, to explain your behavior to others. Now, it of course is true. If your brain was dead, you wouldn't have raised your arm. It's also true that if your musculature and your nervous system were not properly intact, you would not have raised your arm. So of course, the brain and the nervous system and the musculature system are all absolutely crucial to your ability to do that. But do you think that's the whole story? Of course you don't. And that is part of the dominant message of this talk, that we are first, of course, biological machines, but we're a very special kind of biological machine that I will describe in a very little bit. One way of thinking about this is this, and it's a riff off Adrian's talk. Brains don't kill people, people kill people. We don't blame and punish brains, we blame and punish acting persons. The second, and Adrian alludes to this as well, is a cause is not an excuse. If you believe, as I do, that we live in a causal universe, that there's no, nothing outside the realm of causation, just because the brain or the genes or the psychology or the environment or the alignment of the planets play a causal role, 
and they all do, is not an excuse. If that were the case, then no one would ever be responsible for anything, because this is a causal world. Now, I want to say a word that does not apply to my colleagues in this room, but unfortunately it does apply generally. And that is the necessity of avoiding neuroarrogance. So now let me be a little bit deflationary. <clears throat> I said, we don't have minds unless we have brains. Well, it's a very famous issue in philosophy, been going on for forever now. How are our minds related to our brains? How does the brain enable the mind, enable the mental states? Here's the truth. Not one person in the world has a clue. We have no better understanding of that issue than we did 100 years ago when sort of modern neuroscience began. Not a clue. Not only do we not have a clue how the brain enables the mind, we don't have a clue how action is possible. So for example, suppose I have a Huntington's disease, this rare single gene disease, and I have a quote unquote involuntary career movement of my arm. Pure mechanism. We understand a lot about how the, why the arm moves that way. But when I don't have Huntington's disease, when I just move my arm, that was an intentional action. Right? I desired you people to remember something. I believe if I did this little demonstration, it would help you remember. I formed the intent to move my arm, and I did. We have no idea how that happens. Now, once again, your brain isn't intact. Your musculature isn't intact. Your nervous system isn't intact. It wouldn't have happened. But it's clearly not the whole story, and we have no idea, none, how it happens. Now, what is the law?